Okay, so hopefully everyone can see the uh, the uh, the front page there. I'm just going to run a run through a few things um, with that in mind. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by um, constraints, and then look at uh, rather than looking at what the constraints could be, try to put them into some kind of uh, structure that looks around the conditions that would lead to those constraints. And then um, a little bit of time on how you could map those to your organization or your situation. Um, I don't want to go too deep into the market, but I think looking at the market is important because people are seeing their markets change. Um, some people are seeing the markets disappear. Other people are seeing the markets increase and there may be new markets right now. And that's important to think about. It might not be your job to look at those and exploit those in your organization, but you may have to respond to changes that come out of marketing or changes that come out of um, the strategy teams. And then I want to look a little bit about how you're going to assess the impact for that and define what I would say is the new operating environment and then build this new operating model. Um, and if you've read some of the stuff I've written recently, um, there are a lot of people from the business continuity side talking about this as this period of interruption, and then we'll get back to business as, as normal. And I don't know what business as normal is. I don't think we're going back to business as it was. And I certainly don't think we're going back to that for some time. So the point of this, that most organizations work in quarters, maybe semesters, definitely in a year, they have to uh, account for themselves. Um, I think we're dealing this with this for a year. So this is, this is it. This is how we're going to be to some degree um, for the foreseeable future. This isn't something we're going to get out of in a week or two or a month or two. Um, I also think this idea of this binary uh, open close will reopen the, the economy, will close the economy. It's not as simple as that. It's, it's obviously much more complex, but I think using those uh, terms, it's a little misleading. It makes it feel like we're either fully open or we're fully shut. And clearly that's not the case. And it's not going to be the case um, as we go forward. A um, couple of caveats. This is still a draft. Some of the stuff might change. Um, I wouldn't say that they're ill thought out ideas, but they're ideas that are still pretty raw. And in all honesty, if it weren't for this kind of situation where there is such a time pressure, I probably wouldn't share something um, at this stage unless we were sitting down face to face and we worked together. I would be, I'd probably be uncomfortable doing that. But I think right now it's worth doing to just float this and see if it's giving people something to, uh, to work with. Um, Cause I feel that's what people are looking for. Um, just to be clear, nothing in here is healthcare advice. Nothing in here is medical advice. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an epidemiologist. Nothing in here speaks to what is or is not good practice as far as dealing with this illness. Um, everything that I've added here, of a medical nature has come from CDC, OSHA, uh, WHO, some recognized um, authority. And the final thing is every business will have to figure out their own situation and make their own plan. We will not have the time to do that today. That is not the intent of today. Um, but I hope that by the end of today or by the end of the session, next 45 minutes or hour, you have some kind of a framework that if you're looking for a framework, maybe that will help you uh, drive the conversation in your organization. It might give you something to put your teeth into because having looked around, there's a lot of information of specifics, how to wash your hands and, and how to sanitize an area. But we're sort of, and then there's, there's the sort of macro, uh, make sure we have social distancing. And, uh, but there's, there's that bit in between that I feel that we're missing sort of not the guidance of exactly what to do, but just how to form our thoughts and form our decisions to get us uh, through the next stage. And when I talk about the next stage, I'll put a slide up in a second to explain what I mean by that. So <clears throat> I've used the term constraints because I think until we get completely beyond uh, this current phase of, of having something that we cannot treat, we will have some form of constraints in place and we'll have to adapt to those. So just... Um, what I would say up front, I think the constraints are important. Uh, I understand that if people are in the US right now, this is a pretty uh, enthusiastic discussion about whether we do or don't need constraints uh, within my family. This is an enthusiastic discussion uh, that I sometimes have with, uh, with family members. Um, my view, and this is only my view, um, they're absolutely necessary right now. 
because we don't have an answer to this. Um, they are allowing us to buy time so we can figure out what to do. So I think that it's necessary to have some kind of constraints, but I don't think we need to stay there forever. But I do think the if we use it properly, these should give us the time that we need to really figure out what the next steps are. And that could be mass testing. Obviously, over the 12 to 18 month period, that could be a vaccine or a cure. But I think the constraints are absolutely necessary um, right now. Uh, if you've sat in on these before, you know that I'm right now, I'm in Amman, Jordan. Uh, we had a 48 hour lockdown. You could not leave your house this weekend. That's obviously a, a stricter end of things, but my brother lives in New Zealand. They're in a similar sort of condition. Um, and we have very low cases, a uh, very low number of cases, uh, and thankfully very, very few fatalities. Uh, so, but at the same time, we knew it can't go on forever. So I think the constraints do work, the point now is once you have those in place, what do you do next? And a lot of those decisions will be out of our out of our hands. We're going to have to figure out how to react to them. So some of the constraints you can see here, and you'll all have different constraints depending where you are. And there may be some other specific things that are pertinent to you or where you are. Um, but what I've done is I've tried to break constraints into three levels, with the high being the most strict, um, and then low being the probably the loosest. Um, I think where the US and the UK or parts of the US and parts of the UK are now is high constraints. And as I said, in Jordan, we're, these are high constraints. So we have a lot of constraints around what we can do. Um, but the conditions right now, no vaccine, no cure. That's, that's the same for everyone. Limited amounts of testing. Um, and we have inconsistent data and there's a lot of uncertainty. And I'm saying inconsistent data because everything that I read seems to... Um, have different ranges of numbers. And I've seen fatality rates from as low as 1% to as high as 5%. And obviously that's a huge range when it comes to something like this. And my sense is without that uh, certainty around the data, obviously that has a real impact on decision-making at the, at the government level, um, from the healthcare and medical community. So we just got a lot of uncertainty and therefore that leads to us having these higher constraints in place. The next level seems to be, again, my sense is where Taiwan and maybe South Korea are now. Uh, obviously, nobody has a vaccine or a, or, or a cure, but they do have the high volume of testing. So that allows them to do surveillance and allows them to do rapid intervention. It allows them to figure out who might have been infected. And so they can then make risk-based decisions uh, or decisions based on those. Um, and within that location, maybe they're then able to use that as a bit, have a bit more consistency of their own data and therefore make um, slightly better conditions. And so I'm guessing the places that are in high constraint, hopefully when they can get more data and have the testing, will move into the moderate constraints. Now, I'm not trying to tell you what the healthcare policies are, but I've just taken these and broken the constraints down so that when we're thinking about our business, we can think about well, how do we operate when there are high constraints but then what could we do if there are moderate constraints? And then the final stage is the low constraints. And I think that this moderate constraint, that middle part, some places are there now, some places will be there in the future. I don't think any of us get to low constraints until we have a vaccine and or a cure. And that seems to be 12 to 18 months from now to the point where there's enough to really uh, 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 share that with a broad swathe of the population. You also then have widespread testing and a lot more consistency on data and a high and a high consensus around what this uh, what this means um, for people. So we can just make better decisions. We're hopefully all using a, a similar version of the truth. So again, from what we're trying to talk about right now, <clears throat> I think you would have to figure out where are we operating, which which of these is most relevant. Is it the high constraints um, that we have in some parts of the US? Is it moderate constraints that seem to be coming in maybe or are likely to come in in places like California that seem to have uh, the West Coast seems to be comfortable that they have control over it? Maybe they will move over into what I've termed here moderate constraints. And so if you are working with um, across the entire country, if it's the US or internationally, you may end up with different models um, depending where you are. So what you may end up with is you build a high constraint, moderate constraint, low constraint model, and then you just have to apply that depending upon the situation in each of those locations. <clears throat> 
So really this is just to give you a sense of how I've, I've thought about breaking these down. Um, I didn't want to go much further than that because I think then it becomes a little too country or situation specific. But let's talk about the effects because now we can get into the meat of actually doing our planning. So we have things like staff movement is limited. Uh, In-person activity uh, is affected. Obviously our customers are also affected potentially depending with the business that we're in. Supply chains are interrupted supply chain in and then also distribution networks back out and the infrastructure could be limited so by that i don't necessarily mean power water or internet but um, if you're using uh, somebody else's infrastructure for delivery let's say uh, a lyft or an uber um, if that's still running great we did not have taxis here for three or four weeks and so the restaurants were shut but even if they're open they couldn't deliver food so again their their infrastructure uh, was was missing. So I'm talking now about the infrastructure that that you depend upon that is outside of um, of your control. And again, this is where we get into that everybody's situation will be different of exactly what this means for you. But it seems to be these are the four main areas of um, where the constraints affect. And so then we get these different levels of disruption. And the headings I've used here will reappear later because what I'm trying to do is is have the framework that you begin at one end and you can work all the way through to develop this plan. <clears throat> so the headings I've used here, uh, admin management, operation creation, um, just going through those, those are the headings that we can start to use for this analysis. And eventually when we come out at the other end, you'll see how those apply when I match those up to the constraints. So basically the point is, depending upon the level of constraint, you will have different degrees of disruption. And just let me know if this is making sense so far, if you don't mind jumping in the comments or if I've gone completely off the rails, um, that would be super helpful. Um, the risk assessment tools that you have and you use, you can absolutely use those here. Uh, the only point I would make is that when we talk about risks, we're offered often talking about uh, future looking potential things that could happen. Uh, these are happening now. Uh, and they may have already happened. So it's it's probably a small point, but it's worth just clarifying with everyone that if you're using a risk tool, the standard definitions of risk often talk about the potential impact, the potential effect. These are the real effects. We're already seeing these right now. But the same tools can be used to, to help you understand what's going to have the biggest impact, where you're being hit hardest. Because it's going to be a lit, uh, there'll be lagging indicators or lagging data of, say, customer signups. Um, or interest in your product, that may take a while for you to notice, but you could use the risk assessment tools now to sort of just look at it and say, well, if nobody can leave their house, clearly nobody can come to my restaurant. I don't need to wait to see that the tables are empty. I know the tables are empty because they physically can't get here. That's a very simple example, but you can look forward and get a fairly good sense of what the constraints mean for your business. So the first part, there's the, the first part, the intent is to understand the constraints um, that are in place and get, get a sense of when those might change. Because like I said, it's not gonna be like this forever. So you're essentially making a plan in, in chunks. How do we operate in the high constraints? What do we do when those loosen? And what are we gonna look like uh, in the maybe 12 to 18 month uh, phase? <clears throat> like I said, I don't wanna spend too much time on the market. I think the point would be that you had a market, you had a customer group, um, but based upon these uh, these factors, um, you then need to ask, are they still there? So if you think, I was listening to um, an interview with um, Donors Choice, which is a, a, a charity that um, allows you to donate to individual teachers, individual schools on a sort of project basis. But they said their model was based around um, identify the teacher, verify that, you know, if I'm a teacher, verify I'm a real teacher at a school. And then they send the grant, whether that's money or equipment and things, to the school for the teacher to distribute. Well, of course, schools are shut now. So they've had to adjust their model because um, their clients, the teachers, are no longer in the school but the people that the teachers want to give the resources to are often the kids who are no longer at school either. So how do you distribute that? So for them, their, their delivery and locations 
uh, are completely different. The, the, the demographics the same, the product is the same, but the physical location and the delivery method are very different. So they've had to rethink their model and they've been quite clever with that. But the point is you need to think about um, has your market shifted or has your market remained the same or has it evaporated? Because there are markets for all intents and purposes right now, um, high-end fine dining restaurants, that's gone. There's no market for that right now in, in a lot of places in the US. So if the answer to the questions are all yes, they're still there, they want the same product, <clears throat> still the same location, so basically anything online, uh, the market is the same or it may have grown. A lot of the physical markets will have changed. Um, so again, depending upon your um, your business model, then uh, that may have affected your market and then just what you can do. And then you'll get into the business decisions of how long can you, can you put up with this interruption. That's a whole other business conversation. But this is important because as you start to think about your delivery model for your business, you do need to think about the market and the way you're delivering and what you're delivering because the constraints could help or hinder those. So that's why we're thinking about this right now. So you need to think about what is your customer now and how you're going to serve them. And has that changed? Um, if you're one of the online banks versus a bank that was very brick and mortar and still wanted people to physically go in uh, or people are dependent upon a paper check, um, there are some interruptions in place there um, for brick and mortar banking, whereas if you're 100% online and you've always been 100% online, you may be able to increase your market share. Or there could be the growth opportunity. Um, obviously, Amazon is doing uh, fantastically well. Zoom has now become um, a noun, a verb, an adverb, and whatever other grammatical term is appropriate, because now we Zoom, we don't make a video call in the same way that we don't search, we Google. Um, so a huge growth opportunity uh, there and there may be opportunities for people out there too. So we take the conditions and constraints and we look at the market and that's the new operating environment. So for me, think about how we use this tool. If we've got all of our decision makers together, we start by saying, okay, what conditions are we dealing with and what are the constraints? And then what is the market? And then that's our new operating environment. And you can't buck the constraints because a lot of them are in place by, um, by decree. They're being enforced by law enforcement. And, and like I said, I think they're necessary. So we're not trying to buck the constraints, but at the same time, we have an obligation to our customers, to our staff, if we're gonna stay in business to continue to operate, we just need to figure out what that operating environment is. And then we can, and then we can go. And as I said, we're gonna have an operating environment that works under constraints and it'll be a spectrum from the high constraint operation to the lower constraint operation. And then once we've got the mass testing and a vaccine and a cure, then we go back to whatever it looks like, or then we go to whatever it looks like then, not back to, we go to whatever uh, the, the next normal is. Um, and then we carry on until we have the next outbreak or the next um, crisis to deal with. So we're trying to get to the point when we, we define that new operating environment because that's what we need to look at now and then figure out, okay, where do we go? What are we going to do? And this is where we then take the constraints and figure out how do we operate under those constraints? So obviously this is not rocket science and the culmination of this whole thing is a, is a grid matrix. Um, but what I was trying to do was figure out, essentially we're then, I'm just going to go back here, is mapping the market to an extent, but you've put the market to one side and you figured out, okay, what, what are we going to deliver? But then you're looking at the constraints in your operation and your business, and then you're trying to overlap those to say, okay, how do these, how do we incorporate these factors into our business? So how do we uh, incorporate distancing into the different components of the business? Now, your business could uh, require a separate set of columns and you may want to change the terminology, but I've tried to be pretty broad. Management admin should be fairly self-explanatory, back office stuff. Um, operations creation, wherever where the rubber meets the road, whatever it is that you do um, to create things, um, the products that you then pass on to your clients, and then how you distribute those. The supply chain, obviously, is the, is the incoming raw materials, if, if you have that, and you might not have that. Um, but hopefully you can have something like this and then work through these different factors and figure out 
how do they impact us? How do we work around them? What can we do? So I've tried to put together a super simple example using a restaurant. Um, I don't know if that's wholly legible. There's a lot on the screen, but I'll just give you a couple of examples of some of the things that I thought of. So the admin and management part, they can do the work from home thing. Okay, and a lot of restaurants may just use some online bookkeeping and they don't necessarily need to be in there to be managing the thing. So that one's fairly straightforward. Um, with the surveillance side, and I'm talking now about testing and making sure, like this is a pure duty of care thing, that they'll be doing some check-ins with people and saying, how's everyone doing? Uh, you know, are you taking care of yourself? If you're feeling a bit sick, did you, did you go and get checked? Whatever else. But they don't really need to worry too much about the management admin. They can essentially operate under most constraints in the same way that any remote, um, remotely dispersed business can. So that one's pretty simple. This is the classic white collar versus blue collar working from home uh, divide. So they're all working from home, pretty straightforward. On the operations side, so we're talking about a restaurant now, we need to prep the food. Um, so in the distancing, they may change the layout of their kitchen. They may have to reduce the number of people in there to maintain distancing, but if they've got enough space, maybe they can do that. Maybe that's an option for them. Um, they, it's a restaurant, so they're pretty clean in the food prep area, but now they maybe need to think a little bit more about hard surfaces on the way in, like the door handles, and the areas where they get changed, and the bathrooms other than just the pure cleanliness of where they prep and uh, and plate the food. So a little bit of a change there. And then jumping over to the supply chain. So the supply chain is maybe where they'll notice this most because if they have movement controls, depending where they're sourcing their ingredients from, they may not be able to get some of the ingredients with sort of knock on of what they can cook and what's on the menu. They may need to think about how they actually get their ingredients. Previously, they may have gone to the market. Now do they need to have the market come to them essentially. So they can use this to think about how they could operate under these constraints. This is assuming that they've decided there's already a market or they may feel that their market has changed and they really just now want to focus on mid-range, uh, high quality food, not fine dining, because fine dining is the whole white tablecloth and you have to sit there. That doesn't work if you take it home. But mid-range, well, uh, well-cooked, nice food uh, that's a special occasion, not fast food. Maybe they've seen that their niche and they're now going to go for pickup and delivery and they've decided there's a market there for them. So they've already had to, to make the business decision to go forward before they get to this stage. They might find at this point that there are hiccups that they cannot overcome. They might find that um, limits in their supply chain just mean that they can't produce the food they want to. Uh, movement controls might prevent their staff getting into work or limit the number of staff. So if all your chefs live outside the city and there's no transport into the city, straight away you have, you have a problem. So they may get to this stage and realize that they can't operate under those constraints, the high constraints. They might see that they could operate under moderate constraints, so then they understand, okay, we're going to sit in place we will weather the storm while the high constraints are in place. And then we have a plan to move forward uh, when things free up a little bit and the, the, the challenges that prevent us operating have gone and we can operate even though there are still constraints in place, we can still make the business work. So I haven't written up, <clears throat> pardon me, I haven't written up any other, uh, any other examples, but I'm happy to bounce ideas around if you want to jump in and add ideas but the overall intent was to to have this framework so that people can start to put together what does my uh what is my operating model what does my business look like under these constraints and then decide how to go forward exactly what you do for distancing exactly what you do for sanitation ppe that's all the specialist advice that will come from OSHA or CDC or WHO or the National Health Authority. So I'm not trying to tell you what that is. You just have to follow that advice. Similarly for uh, surveillance, what the rules might be on people getting tested and what happens if they're, if they're positive. Um, will we get to the stage where if you have a sufficient level of antibody, you're free to travel? I, I don't know. Um, movement controls, clearly those are imposed by law enforcement, so those are imposed upon you and you need to work within those, um, within those constraints.
but you could, I hope, take this framework and apply it to, I was brainstorming earlier, um, schools, they seem to fit in this, uh, government to an extent, bits of government, I brainstormed and seemed to, 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 to fit in here. Security companies, man guarding, that seemed to, to, to fit. You could, you could work around these. It would just help you work out what your model looks like under these specific conditions. And that's the final part. The, the intent here is designing what, um, what operating under constraints look like. And then you'd still have to make that decision about, um, about validating, is this something you want to do? Uh, is it financially viable? Like, do you have the money to make these changes? Um, do you have the money to continue to operate when your market has shrunk? Plus the additional costs of maybe PPE or whatever it is, um, you know, does it still work? And that's a business decision. And of course, you know, we're, I'm just not in a position to, to, to really help with that at all. But I hope that the framework by, by having this idea of what could the constraints look like, mapping those to your organization, where are we now, um, looking at the market and then understanding your new operating environment. I think once you get to that stage, hopefully those steps uh, will help. And then you have this matrix to just start to put together this new operating model. And hopefully this gives you some way to, to shape that discussion with your decision maker so you can then come out the other end with a plan to get us through this period. Because like I said, and I could be wrong. I mean, like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty and I'm definitely not an expert in this. But my sense is that this is not something that we weather for three or four weeks. And then we go back to how things were in January from the US perspective. I, I don't see that happening. Um, you know, we're already trying to figure out what the middle of the year, September, October, um, you know, into the third quarter look like because things that are not happening now will affect our family and we're not entirely sure, but we fully expect to be impacted through uh, to the end of the year in some way, shape or form. And so I think it's one of those times where if we have a plan and we can operate now, if suddenly all the constraints are relaxed, if there's a miraculous breakthrough and we have a cure, great. We're able to turn all this off and just roll things back out pretty much as they were before. But like I said, I don't see that being realistic. And that's why I also don't like this binary, let's reopen things. We've closed them, we're gonna reopen them because we're not reopening as they were or if you wait for the conditions to be right to reopen as they were, I don't think most businesses will survive because not many organizations have 12 to 18 months worth of cash to just sit and burn. So that's why I don't like this binary construct of we're either closed or we're open. There, there's this graded spectrum and I'm hoping that this gives you some way to, to, to make decisions around that and create these operating models for those different conditions.